Hey, everybody. Hey, Adrian. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Melissa? I am doing fabulous. So I want to introduce you to all the listeners because I know quite a bit about you, but I want to make sure everyone knows who you are before we dive into our conversation. So Adrian Bishop, she is a life and parent coach specializing in helping overwhelmed and anxious highly sensitive moms or parents um, parent their highly sensitive kids with confidence and without losing themselves in parenting or yelling all the time. Yeah. Okay. We have a lot to talk about there. Um, (laughs) She is a certified hypno life coach, which I'm super curious about that. And she's also certified positive discipline parent educator who loves helping families break generational cycles. Well, we can pretty much like break that whole bio down and talk about that in chunks, but I would love if you would just start by just introducing yourself so we can get to know you like as a person before we jump into all of your goodness that you're going to share with everyone today. Sure. So um, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I, a little bit about me. I have three kids aged 12, nine, and five. My oldest is a girl. The younger two are boys. So it's been a a fun ride to say the least. Um, But yeah, so two of my kids are highly sensitive. The older two, I honestly think the third might not be, which is kind of interesting in and of itself because it's a genetic component, but it doesn't mean that every kid will have it. But um, yeah, so it's uh, been a fun journey. I've been in business for about five years now. Um, Recently have been focusing on highly sensitive parents and kids because I feel like they have a unique situation that you know, kind of warrants the need for some tools. Um, so I, I really enjoy working with that population. Um, what else little fun fact is that I used to be an opera singer and a music teacher. Uh, that's what I did before I did. I do what I do now. So yeah, yeah, that's a little bit. I know. I saw that fun fact and I was like, wait, what am I going to ask you to sing? Okay. No, I'm not going to ask you to sing, but that is such a fun Back. So where did you like sing in the opera? Like wh- where did you do this? Yeah. So I was, I was in the Philadelphia opera chorus for a long time, a couple of years. I did um, a bunch of choirs. I did some solo stuff kind of locally. Um, you mostly before, I think before I had my second, I was doing all of that performing. And then I did a little bit more when I had my second, but then I started teaching more full time. And then when I had my third is when I decided to make this to start this business because I was like, I need some flexibility. And I yeah. wasn't super excited about what I was doing teaching wise. Um, so it worked out timing yeah. wise. <laughs> and I was going to ask you about that because I used to also be a school teacher and I think it's great on this podcast to let moms know that like you can shift and change. Like I always thought that I was going to be a school teacher. I always knew that I was yeah. going to be a school teacher. Right? That's what I wanted to do. There was nothing else I wanted to do. And then I've shifted twice. So I love the fact that you used to be a music teacher and you were like, wait a second, like this lifestyle, like my passion, like it's changed and shifted mm-hmm. once I've had kids and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, people think that being a teacher actually is the best uh, way to have kids, like the best job to have kids with. But in reality, it's one of the least flexible jobs out there (laughs) because if you can't do it, you have to find a sub. You have very little personal days because you have all of the summer off. I mean, you probably know that. So it actually creates a really challenging time-wise when it comes to having kids. Like if you have a sick kid or you need them to go to a doctor's appointment, it just becomes really challenging. Um, And I wanted to have a job where number one, I just really enjoyed what I was doing. I, but I also really love working for myself, which I did not think was going to be the case. Yeah. I really thought that I was going to be like, you know, unmotivated and procrastinate and not, and like, of course that happens sometimes, but I actually thrive more like this. And it makes me feel like I have control, which I do over what I choose to do with my day. Um, and if I want to take a break, I take a break. But, you know, I still do the, I still do all I need, all the stuff I need to do in the rest of the day. And I feel, it just feels very empowering to just say like, yep, I'm taking a break and it's all good. Or I'm going to work really, you know, all, all day today and then give myself a break tomorrow or whatever it looks like. Yeah. Um, or I don't really want to do webinars anymore. They're not fun. I want to do, I don't know, Instagram or something. And then just kind of mixing it up and being able to play. So I'm really having a good time with the playing, with the marketing and just, you know, just, yeah, with the business in general. It's been fun. Yeah. So when you left being a music teacher, what area did you focus on first? And before I want to definitely dive in, dive into the highly sensitive, um, you know, aspect, but like, what were you doing first with, with your coaching? Just all parenting, like all kids, like, is that what you were doing first? 
Yes. So honestly, I didn't realize that I was basically speaking to highly sensitive people because I, I thought everyone had the same experience that I did. Okay. <laughs> not knowing that like it was not the case. Like I was like, wait, you don't, you don't feel overwhelmed and anxious when you're parenting? Like that's an option. So I kind of didn't realize that. So I just put it out to everybody. Um, and I was doing a lot of workshops locally at libraries and just, you know, putting myself out on Facebook and people that were highly sensitive were just attracting, attracted to me because I was speaking to them unintentionally thinking that I was speaking to everyone. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of how it rolled after that. <laughs> gotcha. Like, oh. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, I want to dive in because so Adrian was one of the um, 27 speakers that um, was part of the Reawakened Mom Summit. So you may have heard her like short little snippet podcast episode that we ran um, like last month sometime, but I do want to just take it up a notch and really dive a lot deeper into what you do because your presentation had a lot of feedback of people that were like, wait a second. And when I listened to it as well, I was like, oh, wow, like maybe I'm highly sensitive. Like you, I am checking off all the boxes that you are describing. So can we first talk about like, what is highly sensitive for a lot of people, including myself, who did not know that mm -hmm. this was a thing or like, what was this? Because like you, I thought like, doesn't everyone react this way? Wait a second. <laughs> that's so funny, right? And I usually like, I feel like highly sensitive people surround themselves with highly sensitive people unintentionally too. So like their bubble is full of the same kinds of people. But anyway, um, yeah. So highly sensitive is a trait, high sensitivity, high, well, yeah, I guess you can call it high sensitivity is a trait. So it's sort of like introvert, extrovert. So it's not a disorder. Um, it's not a diagnosable thing. It's just um, very, very, uh, it's a grouping of traits. So what happened was in the, this has always been the case. We've always had people that were highly sensitive. It's just around the 91, I think Elaine Aaron labeled it. And she did some research to kind of group these traits and make it more clear as to what it means to be highly sensitive and started writing books about it and doing lots of research. And so that's when the term sort of became popularized. I think a lot of people even then didn't know what it was. I think it is more popular now, to be honest, but her books still hold true and they're amazing. Um, but so, yeah, so when you, highly sensitive, there's like Elaine Aaron talks about this uh, acronym called DOES. So I usually just introduce it that way because it just is easier to, to remember and understand. So the D is depth of processing or deep thinking. So that means everything that goes into your brain, you process it either slowly, deeply, or you think about it a lot. So you'll have kids, this is what it shows up in kids, as very, very deeply into their imagination. They have a very vivid imagination. Or they think through things like, and they're lost in thought a lot, or they're not responding to you because they're sort of in their head. So that's how you would describe a kid that's deep thinker, depth of processing. Also, one of the, one of my favorite terms though, for a, a certain type of highly sensitive kid is old soul. So if you have ever a kid that's like, this kid's like an old soul, like he's lived like, you know, seven lives and he acts like, you know, talking to adults is no big deal. And he connect, you know, he's all these big words and it, you know, doesn't act like a kid sometimes that typically is a highly sensitive kid. I have one of those. Um, and so that's the D and then the O is over sent over stimulated and over aroused. So over stimulation, over arousal, that just means our nervous systems are more sensitive, which is where the term comes from very sensitive nervous systems. So being over aroused just means that your nervous system kind of fires. It gets heightened by stimuli outside of you okay. easier. Uh, so it's harder to stay calm. And then the, uh, the E means empathy, lots of high empathy, very empathetic. There are people that, that call highly sensitive people empaths, but I like to stay away from that because that gives your power away a little bit because you're like, well, I feel everything everyone else feels it's like, okay, maybe, but that doesn't sound like fun to me to have to be you know, subject to all of that. But some people like that. Some people enjoy that. And then the S means sensory processing sensitivity which is actually another way to describe the trait itself. So basically what it is, is like lights, sounds, details, like everything in the room you notice, you, you notice like the one person that's not happy and you notice, um, you, you know, the, the, the random buzzing sound and the smell of gas and, you know, all the senses are heightened essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. so, and also with kids, picky eaters, really super picky eaters because textures are one of the senses, right? Taste. Um, also tags on clothing, uncomfortable clothing, clothing. One of the things I say is like, if you can wear jeans on a regular basis, it's a high chance you are not highly sensitive. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. sort of one of the things I put out there. 
Um, yeah. Some people can. I'm not saying it's blanket statement, but yeah, uncomfortable tight clothes, that kind of thing, really yeah. bothers highly. Sensitive people. Um, so out of the four, like, so I'm thinking, okay, if someone's like, okay, wait, I only resonate with one of those, can they still be highly sensitive? Like, do they have to be all four? Or is it like, oh wow, I really resonate with, you know, I'm overstimulated. I smell everything when I walk into a room. It's like, do you smell that? Like to my husband, or I like odors and perfume, like things like that, like really start to bother me or you know, different things like that. Like, so if you resonate with like one specific area or your child is, you know, when you're thinking as a mom, okay, I'm trying to figure out like, is my child highly sensitive? Yes, yes, yes. You know, they kind of work with the D, but maybe not necessarily the E or in the O and the S, but that's kind of fun. You should make that into a song, but it's like, bingo, what's the name, Mo? Um, anyway, we can come up with that later, but like a rap. it is, I'm like, oh, you can make that into something fun. But how does a mom realize that? Like they don't have to have all four, like they could have just one or two. Is that totally normal? Yes. So there is a test you can take just so you know, Um, you can just Google highly sensitive, highly sensitive child test or person test. But what, what comes up is usually if you have one trait, but it's like super strong, right? Like one of the letters feels really, really, really prominent and very strong. You'll answer probably uh, the test to say, yes, you are. Um, so that is totally possible. And then some people have like no, no physical sensitivities, but tons of emotional sensitivities or only physical and not emotional. And there's also a spiritual component, which I don't, I didn't really talk about today before, but the idea is that, um, you know, some kids, some people can, can sense the spirits, can sense presence of spirits, or they can talk to spirits or they can see them. Again, I've never experienced that. I've never known anyone to experience that, but like a lot of mediums, right. People that are in those kind of fields, yeah. they would probably be labeled as highly sensitive. Um, and they have that, that strong spiritual component. So okay. not all of it has to be there. Totally. Yeah. So now a mom that's listening, if she's like, wow, like that sounds like my child and things that I have been doing, you know, for my child emotionally or behaviorally, like they aren't working, like what's the next step? So if a mom is like, wow, that is my child. I think my child or myself are highly sensitive. What's the next step to help like yeah. move this forward so that they can have maybe a better relationship with their child or handle things differently when problem triggers kind of come up? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So a lot of it has to do with helping your kid to feel like they have emotional awareness and are normal. <laughs> yeah. Like if your kid has a lot of really big emotions, you want to make sure they understand that like nothing's gone wrong here. They are normal. They are totally capable of handling what they feel and just sort of supporting them in that way and also giving them the chance to feel heard. So that's always a big one for every kid, but especially for highly sensitive, if they're not validated, if they're invalidated more than validated, you're going to have a very confused child, like thinking that they don't know what they feel and it's not okay. Um, questioning themselves constantly. So you want to move to really helping them to be aware and do validation as much as possible. Um, another really big piece is I've noticed that correcting a highly sensitive child does not usually go well. So that's one of the main things that people come to me and they're like, oh my God, that's my kid. Like I can't correct them without them having some sort of, you know, outburst or meltdown or freak out. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it's because highly sensitive people in general have a very strong sense of shame. Um, they fe- they're very conscious. They're very self-conscious. So anything that comes up that feels like they're doing something wrong or someone's correcting them, it feels like criticism. And so when we are criticized, we get defensive, shame comes up. Uh, and then of course we're going to fight back. So shame, blame cycle kind of is part of the whole deal. So you just want to watch like the idea of like, when is my child escalating when, when are they getting, you know, and, and how can I calm them instead? And one of the ways to do that is through validation. So if there's anything that you do at all to put into play with your kids, would it would be that. So it would be like, let's say your, your child like pours milk on their, their cereal and it spills. So a lot of times we might get, I don't know, frantic about that or panicked a little or upset because now we have a mess to deal with. And if we say unintentionally, the, well, not intentionally say it, but say something like, you know, you really need to pay attention when you, you pour your milk because it's getting everywhere and you keep spilling. And blah. so that's a correction that your child might feel uh, criticized by. So we want to make sure that instead of that, we say, we ask them a question or we valid and we validate at the same time, like, Hey, but don't worry, we all make mistakes. What do you think you could do next time to make sure that doesn't happen? 
Can you see the difference? So like just kind of opening up like a conversation about it, making it normal to make mistakes, making it okay. That kind of situation doesn't bring up shame. Um, but again, it's like the parent themselves has to be in a good space emotionally to kind of do those things and those tools, which is one of the things that I help my clients with is to like really learn how to regulate their own nervous system so that they can switch into some different tools um, than maybe they were parented with or that they've learned. Yeah. I love examples because I, I'm like a visual, but I'm also an auditory learner. So when you say like the shaming and being aware and like your triggers and, you know, making sure that you're not correcting and shame and things like that, then I'm like, yeah, but I don't think I'm doing those things. But when you give an example, I'm like, oh, that is what I'm doing, but I wasn't meaning to do no, anything. You, don't mean it. you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not meaning to you, you. We all have great intentions and aren't meaning to like harm our child or hurt our child with the words nope. that we're saying. Nope. But um, I love when you give examples because I'm like, oh, that makes so much more sense. Right. Yeah. And it's very unintentional because like I said, like most people don't know what else to do anyway, and they don't know why the child's reacting the way they are. They just like, it's not a big deal. I just told them not to spill the milk. Like, what's the big deal? You know, but it really does make a difference when you shift into different wording around those kids. And it's not like you never can tell them not to do something or never correct them. It's just, you want to kind of balance it out with the validation and the yeah. questions, right? So make it more of that. And then once they get used to the idea that you're not regularly going to bring up their mistakes as a problem, then they can sort of trust that when you do correct them, it's not it doesn't need to be taken personally. So that's kind of where I go with some of my clients. I'm like, you're not going to hundred percent never correct your yeah. child, but just the majority of it might want to be a different direction just so they get used to that. Yeah. Okay. So I have to bring up because, um, one of your Instagram reels went viral and I want to just <laughs> talk about what you said in that video, because I think it is so beneficial. And I think it went viral for a reason because you talked about, when then, and like how things can be like maybe a threat to our kids or seem like a threat versus like, if you reverse some of the things like the semantics, the semantics, sorry, the semantics of <laughs> how you say something, it can be taken so differently. So can you talk a little bit about what is that when then kind of format yeah. that you shared in that Instagram like viral, like real, because I do think it's really, really important. And, and something so simple that mm -hmm. a mom could do. That's like, wow, this could make such a big shift. Yeah. So the idea behind the real is that usually we say like, if you don't clean your room, then you lose screen time or something to that effect. So that's what a threat would be. Because what happens is when you hear that as a kid, it's, it's like a lot of resistance comes up you're angry, you're afraid, you're, you know, all this emotional stuff will come up. But instead, if you make it more of either a first then or a when then, it's just more of a thinking statement. So the idea is when you clean your room, then you may have screen time. And again, it doesn't have to be screen time. It's just an example. People yeah. were actually like pulling me apart when I said screen time on the viral. But it's just, it's just like an example. So you could also say like, when you put your plate in the dishwasher, then you may leave the table or then you may be excused. Yeah. Um, and what happens is kids start to actually think, okay, so that's what I have to do. And they stop really being emotional. So you're, so the idea is to get them out of their emotional brain into their thinking brain, um, which then creates less resistance and makes them feel like they have more control anyway, so they can make a choice. So even though it's not necessarily a choice in the sense of this or this, they still feel like they have control. And it really does uh, make a difference when it comes to getting kids to sort of, I would say, cooperate a little bit more easily. Yeah, no, I, um, no, I really, I liked that. And I appreciate it. And I liked how you, how you said it, because I do, I think it's, it's, sometimes can be very hard as a parent, especially when the the trigger has come up, whatever it may be, whether it is like, okay, well, they're not listening to me or for me, I feel like I need to have control and I know that I have zero control, but sometimes it's hard to remember <laughs> that I don't have control over my children or pretty much almost anything. So like, sometimes I can go off like that. Like I can get angry, like in a heartbeat. And it really probably has nothing to do with my child. It's everything else that has built up to that. Mm -hmm. So do you have tools for, for moms when, you know, if they feel like they're always angry or they feel like they're always yelling, you know, what are some things that you can do to help moms in that situation where it is like, 
stop flying, you know, words coming out of my mouth and then I'm constantly like having to apologize. <laughs> That's how I yeah. feel. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. And a lot of, a lot of people are there too. You know, that's a very common situation I hear about. And, um, you know, I was there too. So it's very normal to do these things. One of them is obviously conditioning. So you have triggers from your conditioning as, as in your childhood experience. So it's a program that you're running in your brain. Um, so that's sort of where the hypno coaching comes in. So I'm able to actually use visualizations in the moment while we're coaching to help you not feel that way. So what we do is like, you have a neural pathway going toward anger connected with whatever your kid is doing. It goes toward anger, this, this road, habit road is what my teacher calls it. And then what happens is you put a roadblock in that habit road in the visualization, like as you're doing, as you're talking through it with me, then that when you have a roadblock, then your brain is forced to create a new path to get around the roadblock and the new path, you choose what you want to feel. So let's say instead of anger, you want to feel calm. Um, we, we just get, we get you to feel calm in the moment. And then we put it on that, uh, that, that, instance that created the trigger. And then when you're going back into real life, you feel calm because that pathway has been broken essentially to anger and it's been reconnected to calm. So that's one way that I help parents do that. And then also, um, you also can like literally just decide you want to feel curious and use a thought that creates curiosity, which, um, one of my clients like loved so much that it was dad. He wanted to tattoo the word, huh? on his hand because it, it really helped him to feel like less angry. Cause he was very like, angry huh? like, huh? Like, like, huh? Oh, huh? Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. I know it's confusing. It can be interpreted. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wait, how does he, what question mark exclamation yeah. mark? I'm like, what is no. This? Yeah. Dot, dot, dot. I would say <laughs> ellipsis. So yeah. So he, he was very, he was very compelled by this idea of getting curious when his kids do something, which again, it stops you from getting defensive. It stops you from getting triggered with anger um, and instead helps you focus on the child because everything they do is really like you were mentioning. It's not about you. It's about how they feel. So the more curious we can get, the more problems we can solve and the more calmer we can be and more regulated, which helps our kids calm faster. So yeah. I would say go to curious. And here's one thought that helps with curiosity. Well, actually it helps with acceptance along with curiosity and a whole bunch of other feelings. But my favorite thought is this is not about me. You can use that one. Mm. <laughs> I would have to get that tattooed like across my whole, like, yeah, I like, you have to be uh, like, wait, or like, my, yeah, I'm like, wait, uh, it's not about me. It's not about me. <laughs> I mean, that's with everything in life, right? Like it is not, it has nothing to do with me. Like it's really exactly. about them or something that they're going through or their day. Like, cause I have no idea what my child was going through in middle school or high school or the baseball practice or the bus ride home, you know, yeah. any of those situations, they're bringing that with them to the situation. And I bringing all my baggage to the situation that just happened in that moment where, you know, yeah, you're like triggering each other crazy. back and forth. It's yeah, the, the trigger ping pong, like back yeah, and forth. Exactly. But I need to win. Like I need to have the last word that I'm like, oh God, you don't have to mm. like just I'm the adult here. Like I'm mm. I'm supposed to be the adult. Like that's that's what I'm like, God, I'm the adult. And then I'm like, why am I acting like why do I feel like I'm acting like a child? Like arguing with my parent when it's my child. Like I need to. Yeah, things that I. That sounds like a conditioning situation to me. (laughs) Yeah, I'll book the session after this. So, but the hypno part, like, is that like, is it something that maybe takes like one or two times? Is it like a longer process? Like, you know what I mean? Like when you have sessions with people, does it take a while to? I used to teach, and um, when I was my last year of teaching, that's what we talked about, like neuroplasticity, and like you can retrain your brain. So these are things that I know. But I always say, just because I was a teacher doesn't mean I know what the hell I'm doing as a parent. Like it has nothing. Oh. I'm like, I have oh, all yeah. these skills, catch and being good, the positive, like all these things that I used to excel at in teaching. And I'm like, I suck at it at parenting. Well, you don't have the emotional attachment in teaching. That's where that's the problem. <laughs> exactly. But yes. No, you're so, you're so correct about that. And like, even when I'm watching another parent's kids or everybody's home, you know, over somebody's over at my house and there's a toddler acting crazy. I'm like totally different experience than if it was my child, you know, and you can be so much calmer and just like help out and know what to say. But anyway, yeah. So what happens is with the hypno, it's, it's not technically hypnosis in the sense of like, I am a hypnotherapist, but I do, it's like, it's unconscious mind coaching is what they call it. Um, but what happens is it is very quick. I mean, some of the visualizations are five minutes and then you have a shift immediately. But the idea is that you might have a tabletop that is anxiety. And under the table, there's all these legs. 
that this situation, this situation, this yeah. situation, and you have to knock down table legs more and more and more until the tabletop falls. So we don't know how many legs there are. We just have to kind of get going and start finding out until the tabletop falls. So yeah. we, yeah, so it does work immediately, but the whole, the whole thing might not collapse until yeah. a certain number of times of going through these situations. Yeah. So is your goal ultimately then to have someone work with you and then they don't have to work with you forever. Like, it's like, oh, you're, yeah. you're done. It's like, okay, we've got like five sessions and you're good and you're feeling good and things are great. And cool. It's not like, oh, it's a therapy session that we're meeting like once a week for the rest of your life. <laughs> no. So that's the cool thing about the, uh, the unconscious mind coaching is that it works really fast and permanently because you are literally changing the neural pathways in your brain. So you don't have to come back over and over and over. And the tools that I have, I give you self-directed, it's called neuroplasticity. So I let you be able to go at home and say, okay, if I'm struggling with having an urge to have a glass of wine, when I've worked on it, I mean, this is just an example, yeah, but yeah. You, you're able to do some of the tools at home to like stop that urge from happening. Or I don't feel calm around my kid or they're yelling in my face and it's really triggering me. What do I do? Oh, okay. So I can use these tools myself and work on that piece. So definitely not something we want to create a dependency on someone else. We want you to feel empowered to have the practice in the, in the sessions, but then also be able to take it home and do it on your own. I have my, my teacher was telling me that she has a, one of her clients would, was, was there, was, was, um, coaching with her at middle school when she was really struggling with like trying out for the play. And then in high school, when she was struggling with her AB classes, and then she came back in college when she was, or when she was taking the SATs. And it just kind of like, yeah. as she would grow up she was getting a job and she needed some help. So she would just come back to her when she had these big transitions happening or some big shifts and just needed that little extra push. Um, yeah. but she was able to, in between to kind of take it home and do it herself. Yeah. Yeah. That seems about right. Because I do think there's, especially, you know, as a mom, you know, you do have, you have like the toddler phase and then you have like the preteen and then you have the adolescence and I'm mixing all those up and then the teenage and then getting ready <laughs> for college and all those kinds of things and all the different, you know, attitudes and things like that, that are kind of happening. And as your kids are transitioning, like we're also transitioning as a mom. Oh, yeah. And that's what I've been going through, like with my kids, because, you know, having teenagers and and feeling like they aren't as dependent on me as they used to be and like finding my role as the mom and trying to be a friend and like, but the parent and boundaries and, you know, expectations, um, yeah. you know, that's been, I feel like that's, this has been the hardest part for me as a mom so far is, is that teenage and kind of finding my, my place and my way in a world where they're trying to find themselves and discover who they are like without me. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, totally makes sense. I think it is a really different situation to have a teenager and having to like be okay with them doing their own thing the majority of the time. And then it's like, where do I fit into this situation? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And they're so much more able to do whatever they want. So it just creates a yeah. whole other challenge. So I love yeah. that. So when you, um, do you, you work with families? So you work with like a husband and a wife or two moms or two dads, or like, do you work with anyone, yeah, you know, basically? I do. Yeah. So I do work with anyone. A lot of times it's, it's, it's both parents and the couple will work with me, but a lot of, but sometimes it's just the mom or it's just the dad. Like it totally yeah. depends on the needs of the family. Um, or sometimes I'll do half the sessions with just the mom and half the sessions with both parents. Right. So it's very flexible. Um, and I do, I do like to kind of cater it to each person to see what they need. And as we have the sessions going, sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, I need my husband to come or I need my wife to, to hear this. And then we yeah. just, you know, switch and we just kind of yeah. mix it up. Um, but yeah, very flexible with that. And I just want to make sure I meet people where they are. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Is there anything you've shared such great information that you feel like you haven't touched on or that you would want to share before, you know, before we jump off this amazing conversation? Um, let me think about that. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you've covered so many different things yeah. and I actually like wrote down notes. I was like, okay, we need to make sure we hit on these things because I know it's such a big topic and it I is. feel like it's not something that I've really had on the podcast before. And after doing the summit, I was like, wow, like so many people were really interested in that and had never even heard of it before. So it can be there about is one. Thing. Yeah. yeah. There is one thing actually that I do like to say to kind of describe what I do for parents. And one of the ways I like to say it is I help them to be their child's emotional coach so that they have the skills to take it home 
and like do what I do for them to, with their kids, because I think that is like the most powerful thing for a child to have someone that's detached enough, like a coach would be to be able to support them, but then also love them to death, right? At the same time, but be able to go to that parent feeling really comfortable, feeling like they can trust that person and under, and they understand them and they will just listen if they need them to. So sort of in that, getting into that role as a parent is really powerful, I believe. So I love to teach my parents how to do that, parents that I work with. Um, and a lot of it is just how helping them to, what are you laughing at? Sorry, I was giggling because you were like, I teach my parents how to do that. And you're like, wait, the parents that, and I was like, oh, I, know. So I caught your little slip there. I say that sometimes. And then I'm like, that's confusing. So I can't say that my clients. Uh, yeah. It's I love that though. I was like, oh, so do you coach your parents? <laughs> <laughs> no, never. That would be, that would be a disaster. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. The holding space piece is, um, so anyway, I teach them how to hold space for their kids and yeah. I feel like that's very powerful. So. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. No, I just love it. And I just, you know, I think it can, can be so great and transformative for just that family dynamic and just feeling, you know, safe and that they have a safe space and they're also safe to be who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that the, the parents aren't or the mom or the dad or whoever isn't trying to change them into being somebody else or like them, but like, you're amazing just the way you are. And mm -hmm. I think that that is just such a great underlying message. Um, and even when you just talk about that and like your emotions and your feelings and it's okay, there's nothing wrong with you for feeling that way. Um, I just think it's really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Awesome. Oh, well, where can people find you? Um, and then I have one last question for you, but I know women are going to want to find out how, okay, how can I follow this amazing lady on Instagram and find out all her reels, <laughs> yeah. and get even more followers, but like, where do you want people to go to find you? Yeah. So my Instagram handle is Adrian Bishop coaching and it's A D R I E N N E. It's like the French feminine. Um, and then also I'm on Facebook. Um, it's Adrian Bishop in Adrian Bishop coaching. And then I have a website, Adrian Bishop coaching. There's a theme. So <laughs> hopefully you'll, you'll be able to find me in those places. Um, so yeah, just reach out and I'd be happy to talk. Awesome. Yeah. And even when you just watch like her, her reels or her stories or yeah. whatever she puts out there, like she's got such great information that you can gauge just totally. like, in, like a short little clip as well. But, um, before we jump off, uh, I do love to end with this last question because I think as women, um, a lot of the time, like I'm really big on self-care and sometimes as moms and as women, like we put ourselves last and, you know, are kind of not really thinking about ourselves as much, but I would love to know what is something that you love about yourself right now, Adrian? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Oh, Melissa. Okay. Um, what do I love about myself? I love that I am persistent. Like I literally will figure something out no matter what it takes. Um, and I also really love to experiment and just have fun with stuff. So I do that with my kids. I do that with my business. I do that with my marriage. Um, and just like, don't take it too seriously and just sort of, you know, if something doesn't work, it's all good. We just move forward and do something else, you know? And, um, I think that's, that's something that I've learned as an adult, especially at, since I've been a coach, I've learned that. And I also have learned that I really love that. I love doing yeah. that. So works well. Awesome. Oh, yeah. well, thank you so much for sharing that. I always, I, I love to just ask that question and just yeah, get a big question. on, on you thinking about yourself. Cause a lot of the time we, we don't do that as much as, as we really need to. So awesome. Right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast and sharing all your amazing nuggets, um, you know, about being highly sensitive, maybe yourself, or maybe you can recognize that in, in your kids and, and make a space that is really, really safe and, um, peaceful, more peaceful for your family. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Bye.